All right, welcome everyone. I am Jared Lynch, I'm here at Rim 5 and a content creator. And I'm joined once again by Meg Noakes. Hello. James Hahn and Guer Glue. All right, um, so today we are talking about asymmetric VR experiences and also just kind of asymmetric experiences as a whole. Yeah. So actually, I'm fairly new to asymmetric experiences, but I know the rest of you have had more experience. So if someone wants to just kind of briefly explain what asymmetric yeah. experiences are. I mean, the basic idea of an asymmetric experience is that like most of the time, if you're playing a game against someone, you're going to be doing the same thing. Like if you're playing chess, for example, you both have the same pieces, you're both playing the same game, you have the same strategic options, and it's balanced because you're operating the same way and you're trying to do the same thing as the person that you're playing with. Um, an asymmetric game is just anything where the two players are playing a very different game from each other. That might be as simple as, you know, your opponent has a different set of pieces than you do. And it might be as much as you're playing on a board and they have cards that they're playing or something that's totally different from the way that you're playing the game. Um, when we're particularly talking about VR, what we're really talking about with asymmetric experiences is the idea that one person is in VR and the other person isn't. So you have one player who's doing something in virtual reality and the other person is using a phone or a computer screen or some other device to interact with them playing a different side of the game. Um, and it's a really cool opportunity to play around with the, like, the way we play with each other and the way we interact. Um, but different games can take it in really different directions, which we'll kind of see as we talk about them today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was an awesome uh, uh, overview of, of symmetric, asymmetric experiences. Um, and then, yeah, and so, and we will talk a little bit about just like kind of other non-VR asymmetric experiences, just kind of provide some uh, other context for that. But um, we have a handful of just like asymmetric experiences. Some of them we have in the in, at, at Rim Five. Some of them that we have just play tested at Rim Five. Um, and then so one of the ones that I really like that we'll be talking about it's actually a uh, James's background right now, but it's called Reiko's Fragments. Um, and so just kind of a brief overview of this one. So so in uh, Reiko's Fragments, you are trying to find this little shrine and it's it's being held up by this like all the, there are all these dolls in a haunted house and you have to walk around the haunted house and you move like really really slowly to kind of add the tension um actually has everyone has, james have you played Rako's fragments i have i've tried it one time and i've seen a lot of gameplay footage of it since <laughs> Yeah, sure. I've also only played it once, and I uh, will not play it again. <laughs> I don't think I will either, very, unless you want someone memorable. screaming. Yeah, watching watching Guer play was absolutely unmatched. I will never forget the squeal. Um, you should do it again just for me. I didn't get to witness this, and I want to witness it. It was because it was the very first time. None of us had played it. We didn't know what the mechanics were. And she yeah. just out at me after two freaking seconds. Um, yeah, I think you were in there for maybe 12 full seconds tops. Yeah, mine, was, <laughs> mine was the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I played it a handful of times. Yeah, yeah, I have, I have two. Um, actually, I don't think I really finished explaining it. But, um, but so you are trying to find the correct... Uh, like kind of sigil or like talisman and then return it to the shrine that's upstairs. It mm -hmm. kind of looks like this, like yeah. right here. Yeah. A Tori gate. Um for anybody Ooh. Who Ooh. <laughs> Do you have do you have a cultural knowledge of that? I mean there's a there's a bunch of stuff around them, but like they're erected as gateways at a lot of different Japanese shrines and stuff. So they'll have different spiritual bleh, spiritual significance depending on who you talk to. Um but they're basically a staple of like Japanese shrine architecture. Um so it's like a very familiar, very like strong cultural icon to have as like your central thing. Um and like passing through the Tori gate is like passing through a spiritual gate, gates of understanding, all this other stuff. So um, it's just sort of a powerful piece of symbology that works really well in like a horror experience like Reiko's because it provides this really strong spiritual overtone of like mm -hmm. the exorcism and the haunted house and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. I did not know that. Um, so I, I feel like I feel like Reiko's does have a lot of kind of those overarching like nods or just like like 
yeah, like nods to, to, to culture and to spirituality, which is pretty interesting, just like from a storytelling perspective. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, but in Reiko's, um, as the player, you are returning that shrine upstairs to the to the to the gate, and then but then you are being followed through the house by this ghost named Miko, who she can't see you, but she can hear you. And if she finds you, she will just murder you immediately. You cannot get away from her. So it's a nice, good, like, slow-paced game. Um, and then so kind of where the asymmetric elements of it come from with uh, other people can, can add their own haunts into the house. Um, and then they're playing mm -hmm. on, their, on their phones. Um, and then so you can like make the door slam or like make the lights flicker or uh, make like a big loud noise like down the hallway. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where the asymmetric elements come in. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> for a little perspective on what it, that looks like, um, the person inside the VR headset is going to have like the perspective of first person inside the whole house looking around. But those outside of the headset on their phone, I like to describe it as like almost like a board game type mm -hmm. of view where they have a top view think of like clue or risk or if you've any you played those it's like or betrayal even like the top down view of like a house of different sections and then you click on a different section as well as the haunt that you want to use and that goes off in that area and you can i think see the player's location on that mini map like once they start moving around it like highlights the room they're in so you have an idea of where they are mm -hmm. um so even if you can't see what they're seeing, you have an idea of what's happening. Though I think the best way to play it is if you can like see a screen with a VR person's perspective on it. Yeah. Because uh, that lets you do the fun things like slam doors in their faces right as they're opening them. <laughs> and uh, I was going to say another thing that I like about um, kind of how Reiko's is designed is that, like you don't need to download an app. You just go to a website. And then you just enter in a room code. So like really similar to like Jackbox games, if you ever played Jackbox, um, which I just, I think that just like by eliminating that one step, it's just so much easier to get into. And I like when experiences kind of cater to that, kind of know like yeah. how to ease people into it. Especially for the crowd perspective, like with Reiko's being able to jump in really easily and just say like, okay, yeah, sure, I'm in. And the controls themselves for the phone players are pretty simple. And there isn't a lot of pressure on the phone players to like do a ton. It's a very like, okay, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to hit some buttons, drop some haunts, see what happens. Um, and for a party game, that like really low level of like startup cost is really nice for the people who are on their phones. Um, makes it really easy to convince people to join in on it, and it's and it's just a fun game to watch yeah. people play, especially if they have no context of it, or like just just enough context so they know how to get around. But yeah, it's it's like one of those experiences that I think it's like legitimately frightened most everyone that I've seen go through it, at least like the first time. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's fun because it's full of jump scares, and then, like, as you're trying to find these, like, fake dolls all across the house that, like, your friends are planting on you, ones that are just, like, already in the game, um, you have jump scares there. But then there's also this, like, terrifying lady who, like, follows you by sound. So, like, while you're trying to, like, find these dolls, you also are, like, picking up objects, trying to, like, throw them to get this lady to stay away from you. So it's just like, there's so much happening, so many jump scares. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And an mm. Another thing to note, you really, I, from what I remember, you really can't hear her or no. until she's like, or even see her that well until she's like on you. Because I remember yeah. me going up the stairs, not hearing anything. I look around a corner and she's right in front of my face. Fantastic. Yeah, I would say if there was one downside to the game for me, it would be the fact that for the VR player, um, there's a lot to figure out the first time you jump in in terms of what's going on. You have to figure out how to move, make sure that feels comfortable, how fast you move can be kind of weird if you're like not used to it and you can get kind of turned around. Like picking up and throwing the objects feels a little bit weird and it's not really clear how to use them right away. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember once I had somebody play it who, like, managed to get the doll, the correct one, but, like, couldn't remember where to go with it and got kind of lost. Um, 
the VR experience, like this, the horror of it is the best when you don't really know what's going on. But when you don't really know what's going on with the VR, there's this high risk of getting kind of turned around and confused and not really staying immersed. Um, it's really, really fun, but I've seen some people get lost by the fact that just like the gameplay for the VR player could be a little bit tighter. Yeah, as I say, it definitely took me a handful of playthroughs to really get a grasp of like, what the story is, what information do I really need to pay attention to, and like, yeah, then what the controls are and everything yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> All right. Yeah, so personally, I really like Reiko's Fragments. I think it's a really fun game to put people in, um, but we have some other ones to discuss as well. Um, the next one on the list is Take Wings, which actually I don't think that I have played that one, so if someone else would like to uh, kind of talk us through that one. Which one? Uh, Takelings. Take I think you're the one who's played Take that. Takelings, yeah, I, yeah. I played her at once, um, a little bit, and I think, so, there's, like, a couple different, like, storylines of the game. I think there are, like, maybe three different environments, and the one that I played, you, like, have this, like, circuit board in front of you and a hammer um, as the person who's in VR. And then the person who's outside of VR is like a little creature inside of this circuit board. And mm -hmm. all these circuits are numbered. And as the person in VR, you're trying to like destroy the little creature who is your partner outside of VR. Um, and yeah, I remember it being kind of confusing and not super like well synced up with the person who was outside of VR with me. Um, yeah. Were there any um, takeaways from like like things that you didn't like about the gameplay then? Like um, would have changed? Yeah, I mean, I think it was like very, as far as like the mechanics of the game, like it just wasn't like, you'd like go to like hammer in a circuit and it would just be like an inch off of where you were. So it was pretty challenging to just like play the actual game just because the mechanics were a little off. Yeah, I remember it came out earlier than most of the rest were talking about. It seems like it was kind of an early try at the whole asymmetry thing that might have uh, might have ended up being a little too clunky for its own good, which is especially mm. bad when you're trying to sync players across platforms, because then, like, you know, how are you going to play if you're not really in sync with each other? Mm. All right. Okay, yeah. so those take leans, it sounds like it was kind of an early foray into yeah. asymmetric VR. Yeah, yeah, I'd be down to give it another try, but just the day that yeah. I happened to try it just wasn't wasn't on point. And I mean, sometimes things are just finicky. It's like, I, mm. I don't know, sometimes it's the tech, sometimes it's the experience, but... Tech in general is just finicky. It works yeah. sometimes, it doesn't work the other time, and you don't know yeah. why it doesn't work those times. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so then we can uh, kind of just move along with the list um, to Akron, which I really like this game. I think it's so fun, um, really easy to get people into, um, but uh, if someone else would want to kind of talk us through it. Yeah, so there you go. Akron! Yes, right here. I love this one. I went the wrong way. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Um, this one is great. I think um, one of the things that really contrasts it to Reiko's, in my opinion, was the fact that being the VR person feels like super fast and intuitive and easy to pick up. Um, but so what it is, is you're a tree. As the person in VR, you're the giant angry tree on James's right um, that he's pointing at now. Um, and all the other players on their phones or tablets or whatever are playing as little squirrels that are trying to steal your golden acorns. So the person on their phone has like a little game pad. They're running around, jumping, hiding, trying to get close so they can grab an acorn and run away with it. And what you have is just a bunch of things you can grab and throw at them. So you can grab them if they get too close. You can throw like acorn bombs at them. You can like roll big balls of vines that bounce around and get in their way. Um, it feels really solid as the tree because you have this clear goal to defend and you're just like flailing around like a madman trying to knock these squirrels away um, before the timer runs out. Um, and in the meantime, the squirrels are trying to play this like team tactical game where they can like choose different squirrels that have different abilities that can like run fast or dig secret tunnels. Um, and they're all trying to figure out how to like combine their powers and get past you. And you're trying to pay attention to them and like figure out what's going on. Um, 
the head to head competitive nature of it for me is really what makes it feel fun because there's this really clear goal for both people and you can both just get really into it. And it's also a really fast game too. Yeah. So yes. like, it's really easy to get in, play a couple games and it's just, it's, it's, yeah, it's a super like satisfying game. And so even if you lose, you're just like, yeah, whatever. Okay. Let's play again. You know, yeah. you can just like yeah. do a bunch of quick rounds. Um, yeah. And even, like, I think, like, playing as a squirrels, like, it just, like, you kind of instantly kind of have a, almost a sense of community, even if it's, mm -hmm. you're playing with complete strangers, like we've done in, like, some, like, play test um, nights, mm -hmm. like, where we're testing content. So, yeah, it's just, like, you could just be playing with strangers, but it's just, it's just fun. Like, you're, you're squirrels, you're trying to steal acorns from a tree. Like, it's, it's goofy, it's fun, and I, I, I really like this one. Well, another thing about this, like, if you compare it to Reiko's, I like the fact that it's engaging constantly for everyone. Mm -hmm. Whereas, if you're in Reiko's, a lot of the time it's the VR individual that's constantly having to do stuff, being aware of things, where the outside people are kind of spectators with a little bit of action here and there. But mm -hmm. in Reiko's, whether you're inside of VR or outside of VR, you're going to be constantly engaging with each other. It's going to yeah. be constant back and forth, so no one gets really bored. Yeah, and the respawn time for squirrels is really, really low. So, like, if you get knocked out or, like, thrown out of the arena, you come back, like, three seconds later. You're never just, like, sitting around watching, um, which feels really good. Mm -hmm. now, overall, this might be, like, my favorite of a lot of the asymmetric games we've played so far, only because mm -hmm. of just how tight the design is. Um, and I think there's a lot of room for more things like this to, to happen with like one big VR person in place and a bunch of people running around them trying to do something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that that framework could be, it could be applied to so many different just mm -hmm. situations, different characters, mm -hmm. and just different kind of stories, but just really similar framework. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. So, in, yeah, and yeah, Acron is one that we've um, we've actually had the chance of actually like, putting people through, like putting um, new people through, and some of them have never done VR. So it's just it's a really ease of there's a really low like ease of access. So it's mm -hmm. just it's easy to get people in and for everybody. I mean, those yeah. VR controls are super simple. A little weird to get used to, but like no more so than anything else in VR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's it's a really good one. Uh, so then, yeah, do we want to talk about Panopticon as well? Yeah, I love this one. Um, Jared or James, did either of you get a chance to play this? I know Meg and I did a couple rounds. Mm -hmm. So I haven't gotten a chance to play it, but I have looked at a bit of mm -hmm. details for it. So if I remember correctly, the VR individual is like this, like, how do you describe it? Like this, I like to describe it as like a cartoonish looking floating eye. Or whatever. Yeah. I mean, and literally then, a panopticon, right? Also yeah. <laughs> floating in the middle. Yeah. yeah, and then there's these like shadow like individuals, which are the other players outside of VR, where they're controlling someone, and you have to do objectives while the person in VR is trying to figure out which one of these people are you, because you're like you're essentially blending in with these like NPCs or like these other AIs that look exactly like you. Yeah, so the flavor is like that the, the, the PC player, who's on a keyboard and mouse actually, um, is like one of a bunch of worker drones in this like giant, weird, spooky looking cyber factory. Um, but they're a rebel. So you have to do a bunch of actions to like sabotage the factory and destroy everything. It's just like, you know, flipping levers, going somewhere to grab an object and placing it somewhere else. Um, but this big surveillance eye, the person in VR is trying to find you and shoot you with their laser to like destroy descent. Um, but your advantage is that you look exactly like everybody else and you can literally hold down a button to like make it look like you're doing your job like everyone else is supposed to. So the whole point is to sneak around and blend in while the person in VR is hunting for you, which is like a really cool dynamic, if a little intense, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, I remember playing mostly as the person on the PC, and you just use WASD to move around, and you just have to do these, like, you know, skill checks, pretend that you're working, and then go, like, dismantle the establishment, basically. Rage against the machine. Yes. Um, um, yeah. 
So actually, just uh, just kind of what we're talking about the controls. So like using a keyboard control as compared to like a cell phone, well, like or or like a, a tablet. Like what is kind of everyone's like preferences that they find? Like what if what if you all liked about like being the the, the other player non VR? Like yeah. what type of controls? Um, you, you, I mean, using anything that's like on an app is like usually easier, like coming from a mobile device, especially if you're not like a person who has gamed before using the keyboard style. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's easier to like put people into the ones that are just like mobile. Um, but I think for the game, I think for like um, Panopticon like specifically, like the keyboard is like kind of a must. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of like the keyboard gives you a little bit more precision, especially in like moving and controlling where you're looking and lots of little things that you wouldn't be able to do as well. And like, personally, like coming from a direction where every phone I've ever had has been like a budget kind of janky older phone. The first time I tried to play Akron, it was like clunky and it was hard to push the buttons the right way. So you kind of have to worry more about the device because that really affects how good the controls feel. But I remember once I got onto like an iPad and I was playing it, it felt really smooth. Um, so I think it's going to depend on the game and how precise you want the controls are and like what sort of device you're running, you know? Um, I wouldn't want to play Panopticon if I was like using a laptop trackpad for my mouse because that would be absolutely impossible. Um, for the same reason I wouldn't want to play like Acron using like a really crappy phone. Um, so you just kind of have to be conscious of that and then like... I don't know, my personal preference is for keyboard and mouse, but that's because I grew up doing that. So, like, it's super easy and yeah. for me. I think for my case, though, like, I grew up with keyboard and mouse, but in terms of VR asymmetric experiences, I would personally like it if it's, like, more geared towards, like, mobile outside of the person in VR. So yeah. just, just because of the convenience of it. Like, I don't like the fact that like for setup for asymmetric experiences you're constantly going to need like a computer running if for the vr experience user as well as someone else for like whoever is outside of vr and the fact that you have to constantly set that up it also i also want to be able to view like them inside of vr while i'm doing these asymmetric experiences so i feel like it's more convenient that way for mobile also it's easier for people to set it up sometimes that setup can be a little more complicated so yeah. i feel like the ease of access for asymmetric experiences just because there's not a lot with it in terms of vr experiences right now i prefer those yeah. like on the shorter end i do actually playing pan optic um when we were uh, both like at the same pod like you have to be at the computer that the person playing in vr is tethered to so you're kind of like butting shoulders and it's like an awkward place to sit because oh, you can't right. see what they're doing yeah um it kind of, it felt like it needed to be played online. And so like for like hosting a party and doing asymmetry, which I think is something that I really love about asymmetry with VR, you basically have to have mobile because it has to be something everybody can play on. Yeah. All right. And so, so also um, kind of before we um, wind down, um, like what, what, kind of games or experiences would you all want to see within asymmetric if you could make mm -hmm. anything yeah i mean so up until now like all the asymmetric games we've talked about are either one-to-one -one or it's a bunch of non-vr people against a single vr person and mm -hmm. obviously that makes a lot of sense but i'm really interested to see what sorts of games you can do if you have like four people playing online on a vr squad with one person on a pc like playing against mm -hmm. Like, imagine, like, four adventurers in a dungeon, but one person is, like, the evil dungeon master who's on a PC, like, dropping enemies for them and, like, making evil plans. Like, when you put the single person who's, like, in the, like, mastermind seat on a PC, they have a lot of fine control, whereas VR is really good for just, like, experiencing what people throw at you and reacting on the fly. So I think that could be really interesting to see. VR D&D &D would be... <laughs> right? Like, oh. The next new thing. Yeah. It'll be out at some point. Eventually. <laughs> Eventually. Oh, if only more people owned headsets. <laughs> this is not an advertisement. You should not go on a headset today. Uh, something else I was just thinking about. If it was like, uh, so kind of like Akron, but as the tree, you're like an int from Lord of the Rings. And then all the squirrels are like orcs. 
that'd be fun. I think that'd be super fun. Down, yeah. Yeah. Or like Elven Assassin, but someone is controlling all the orcs and trolls and everything. Oh, so yeah. Very similar ideals. But... That'd be super cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm still a really big fan of Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. Yes. Oh, I, I forgot about, about that one. Yeah. yeah the only co-op game. one, too, of all the yeah, ones. Yeah, that game is sweet. Um, it, it takes a while, I feel, to figure it out because as the person outside of VR, you're trying to talk to the person in VR on how to dismantle this bomb. And there are, like, all these different modules that the person outside of VR has to go through and, like, it, it can be a lot of information, and when you, like, don't know what the person in VR is seeing, it makes it even more challenging. So it's, like, requires a huge amount of communication on, like, both parties. Super stressful. Um, yeah. But actually, um, for me, Keep Talking is basically my favorite example of when a VR port of a game, so, like, a VR adaptation of a game, was super successful. Because Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes was originally just for PC, and you were supposed to play online with your friend. So one of you saw the manual, and then your friend in some other living room somewhere could see the bomb. Mm. Um, you know, that's cool when you can play online. But when they put that in VR, now not only do you have a physical bomb in front of you that you're using your VR hands to play around with, which is super fun, but you can be in the same room and actually have like a physical printed out manual, which feels really good. And yeah. it, takes, it takes the whole experience and just makes it feel so much more fun and lets you play it in groups way easier because you can all be shouting over each other. Mm -hmm. um, that game needed to be in VR, and it just was unfortunate that when they first made it, VR wasn't out yet. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can get this. Yeah! So, oh, yeah. With, the bomb. Uh, with the backgrounds. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Like, this is what the bomb would look like. Yeah. Um, and each of those is increasingly horrifying puzzles that you have to solve with somebody's help. Yeah, something else is interesting about that one is, like, you can very quickly, like, it just, like, developing the communication and just, like, like, mm -hmm. like Meg was saying, it's just like, but like trying to figure out how to communicate with other people. That's like some people are really good at reading the manual and some people are really good at describing the puzzles on the bomb. Whereas like other people are really slow at reading the manual. Like I'm really slow at reading the manual. So like, I'm not a good, like, like, clue giver. yeah, I'm not a good clue giver. Yeah. But, like describing the things on the bomb and like wiring those and like translating the information the other person is giving me. I'm pretty quick at that, so it's like I'm much better at that position. Well, also, if you think about it as someone new to this, like, look at, like, this top part of the bomb here. Like, how would you describe that as compared to this one on the side, like, over here, right above? Yeah. Like, describing these things, mm -hmm. especially for someone that has never done VR, they're looking through a manual, and it could describe them. But, you like, for everyone that's new to it, it's like you got to think of a whole process to describe them when you're on a time limit. And then you got to get that information across and figure out. And for the re person reading the manual, you got to figure out how to process that information and then send back the necessary information as well. And it's like, you guys could have completely different thought processes. So like, giving, I feel like I would be horrible at receiving information because people could be describing it in one way and I could think a completely different way. So it's Absolutely. Like, and if you like get on the same page, you're just totally doomed from the start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, even if you know what you're talking about, I feel like right from the get-go, you still have to be fast enough to constantly do these tasks while worrying about, oh, how much time do I left, have left? Oh, am I missing something? Because yeah. Here and there. Yeah. Also, uh, we're just not going to talk about who's on first because that puzzle was evil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a monster, and that's all I'm going to say. And we're done with that conversation. Um, yeah. Was there anything awesome. really left out? Did we forget any big asymmetries? There are more out there. I mean, people are... There's people a lot. ...ideas for them all the time, but mm -hmm. uh, it remains to be seen, like, what people will do with it. And especially mm -hmm. with online asymmetry, I'm excited to see what sorts of, like, VR or PC combos people come up with. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, when the next Nintendo generation has VR support and you've got Switch controllers and one person in a headset. Like, that's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> We can dream. Or no, <laughs> not dream. We can look forward to it. There we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'll come out eventually. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you all very much for talking about um, asymmetric VR games with me. Um, until next time, I guess we can uh, sign off. Yeah. Right. See you later. Bye.
Gracias.